Good evening, welcome to California Today. I'm Liang Zhang. Here's a preview of some of today's stories. Proposed the statewide jab mandates for students are rolling back. A state senator recently pulled out his student vax bill, and the governor is making a similar move. The Bay Area has seen two large fires this week. Firefighters have contained both, but the causes are still under investigation. Twitter is defending itself from acquisition. The social media giant adopted a poison pill after Elon Musk said he intends to buy it and make it a private company. Another California vaccine mandate bill bites the dust. The author who was looking to mandate COVID jabs for all students decided to pull his bill from being considered. Let's hear the reasoning. Senate Bill 871 would have required all K-12 students to receive the COVID-19 jab without personal belief exemptions. Democratic Senator Richard Pan introduced SB 871 back in January, but on April 14th, he announced he is tabling his legislation. Pan said COVID-19 vaccination rates are insufficient among children and that parents are struggling to find the time and transportation to get their children vaccinated. He said in a statement, Until children's access to COVID-19 vaccination is greatly improved, I believe that a statewide policy to require COVID-19 vaccination in schools is not the immediate priority. While SB 871 will no longer be pursued, Pan said he is committed to pushing policies to combat COVID-19 in schools, such as testing plans and an updated immunization registry. Meanwhile, Republican Assemblyman Kevin Kiley praised the removal of the bill. He said in a statement, Thanks to the overwhelming opposition from California families, SB 871 has been defeated. This is a major victory for students and parents across California who made their voices heard. Six more pandemic-related bills are still active in the state legislature. A protest against the bills is set to take place on Monday. In a similar move, Governor Gavin Newsom is delaying his statewide COVID-19 vaccine mandate for all school children. But now state officials are putting a pause on that idea. Here's what's changed. Governor Gavin Newsom's administration announced Thursday that California is delaying its COVID-19 vaccine mandate for students. Uh, we wouldn't explore and implement any uh, vaccine requirement for school-aged children before any sooner than July 2023. Last year, California was the first state to announce a requirement for all school children to receive the COVID jab by the start of the 2022 to 23 school year. At the time, Newsom said he was waiting for the U.S. Food and Drug Administration to give approval to the vaccine for school-aged children. As the calendar inches closer to the fall semester, school administrators said they would not have enough time to implement the vaccine mandate. So based on these two facts, we don't have full M uh, FDA approval, and uh, we recognize the implementation challenges that uh, schools and school leaders would face, that we are not uh, moving to have a vaccine requirement for uh, schools in this coming academic year and no sooner than July uh, 2023. Galley said California has no plans to impose new statewide pandemic restrictions. The move comes at a time when COVID cases and hospitalizations have remained low. Uh, frankly, we're almost at the lowest number of COVID patients uh, that we've had at any point in the pandemic, uh, nearly as low as last summer, uh, right before the Delta surge. And in the ICUs, I think we are at our lowest level uh, in the pandemic. Meanwhile, the California legislature is considering a handful of bills that would mandate policies related to the pandemic. A protest against the bills is set to take place on Monday. A fire broke out Wednesday night at a central California food processing plant. Firefighters have contained a fire and the evacuations remained in place until Thursday afternoon. Here are the details. Selena's firefighters contained a massive blaze at a food processing plant that broke out around 5.45 p.m. on Wednesday. The fire destroyed Taylor Farms, a salad packaging plant in Salinas, about 110 miles south of San Francisco. The four-alarm fire prompted authorities to issue an evacuation order to thousands of nearby residents and shelter-in-place orders to another tens of thousands in the surrounding area. 
The flames were under control by late Thursday morning. By Thursday afternoon, the shelter-in-place and evacuation orders were lifted after crews cleared hazardous materials from the scene. Authorities initially said they feared the fire could generate an explosion and a plume of hazardous ammonia, but the Salinas Fire Department later confirmed those threats appeared to be minimal. Firefighters say the cause of the fire is still under investigation. Taylor Farms says its immediate plan is to continue operating its Yuma, Arizona facility. Federal law enforcement agents are now helping the San Jose Fire Department investigating a fire that burned Home Depot to the ground on Saturday. The two agencies will work together to determine the cause of the massive fire that destroyed the building. Agents with the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives, or ATF, arrived Wednesday to assist the San Jose Fire Department with the Home Depot fire investigation. The Home Depot store in South San Jose caught fire over the weekend. The five-alarm fire destroyed the home supply store on the 900 block of Blossom Hill Road, forcing nearby residents to shelter in place due to smoke. San Jose's fire chief said his department would remain the lead agency in the investigation and welcomed the Bureau's investigators and resources. Fire Chief Robert Sapien Jr. said agents from SJFD and ATF will work collaboratively and expeditiously to gather witness statements and thoroughly investigate the cause of the fire. The ATF's National Response Team offers expertise to federal, state, and local investigators with large-scale and complex incidents that involve fire and explosives. Special Agent Patrick Gorman said in a news release that his team will continue our investigation at the scene until we come to the determination of either incendiary, arson, accidental, or undetermined. So far, investigators speculate the fire started in the store's lumber section, but say the investigation is still in its early stages. Anyone with information about the April 9th blaze is asked to contact ATF and SJFD at 1-888-283-3473 or by visiting reportit.com. All calls and tips can remain confidential. Cynthia Kai, NTD News, California. Twitter announced on Friday that it has adopted a poison pill after Elon Musk proposed to buy the company and take it private. It will make it taking over a corporation more difficult. Twitter said Friday that its board of directors has unanimously adopted a poison pill defense after Tesla CEO Elon Musk announced to buy the company. The move would allow existing Twitter shareholders to buy additional shares at a discount. That would dilute Musk's stake in the company and make it harder for him to hold a majority of shareholder votes in favor of the acquisition. Twitter's plan would take effect if Musk's roughly 9% stake grows to 15% or more. Yeah, Elon Musk, this is really a playbook from 1980s corporate raider. That's what he's doing with Twitter. I mean, this is really what I believe is going to be the, the first step into him ultimately owning Twitter after a soap opera plays out. The poison pill would reduce the likelihood that any one person can gain control of the company without either paying shareholders a premium or giving the board more time to evaluate their offer. Even if it discourages his takeover attempt, Musk could still take over the company by waging a proxy fight in which shareholders vote to retain or dismiss the company's current directors. Twitter said the plan doesn't prevent the board from engaging with parties or accepting an acquisition proposal if it's in the company's best interests. On Thursday, Musk offered to buy the company for $43 billion, saying the social media platform needs to be transformed as a private company in order to build trust with its users. But because of the freedom of speech issue, and it's become a divisive area that Musk has now inserted himself in, he's trying, as the richest person in the world, to basically own Twitter. $43 billion, he's obviously the only person in the world that can have access to that type of money. Probably about half that will be done in debt. And Twitter, from a corporate defense perspective, the board's back against the wall. Fiduciary responsibility. In the filing, Musk said, I believe free speech is a societal imperative for a functioning democracy. I now realize the company will neither thrive nor serve the societal imperative in its current form. After Musk announced his stake, Twitter quickly offered him a seat on its board on the condition that he would limit his purchases to no more than 14.9% of the company's outstanding stock. 
but the company said five days later that Musk had declined. We're going to take a short break, but here's a look at what we got for you when we come back. A man in Southern California pleaded guilty to threatening a Florida representative last year. He could face imprisonment. California environmental scientists suggest not labeling an iconic desert tree as endangered. This call comes after environmental groups said it is threatened due to global warming. Easter is coming up, and people will flock to pet stores to buy a bunny to celebrate. But one nonprofit foundation said that's not a good idea. That and more on California Today. A Southern California man pleaded guilty to making a violent threat to a U.S. representative last year. Let's take a look at what happened. I thank the gentleman for yielding because I think someone may be trying to kill me, and if they are successful, I would like my constituents and my family to know who stopped their arrest. Now, half a year later, federal prosecutors said a California man pleaded guilty on Thursday to threatening Republican Representative Matt Gates from Florida. 59-year-old Eugene Hughesman of Thousand Oaks left a voicemail at Gates, Florida office in January last year. Court documents say Hughesman called Gates a tyrant and said, I'm going to put a bullet in you. The U.S. Attorney's Office for Northern Florida said in a statement that Hughesman pleaded guilty to one count of transmission of a threat in interstate commerce. The charge could land Hughesman in prison for five years. Court documents did not give a reason for his threats. Hughesman called on January 9th, three days after the January 6th Capitol protest. The Secret Service previously investigated Hughesman in 2018 for making threats against a former president's family, according to documents in the plea agreement. The specific president is not named. Hughesman would be sentenced on June 30th. Google plans to expand in California, investing billions in 2022. The company is looking to invest in properties around its headquarters and in the rest of the state. The tech giant Google plans to spend over $3.5 billion this year on California offices and data centers. Google announced recently that it includes expansion in Mountain View, Sunnyvale, and Los Angeles. Google CEO Sundar Pichai said in a statement, Google's offices and data centers provide vital anchors to our local communities and help us contribute to their economies. As we embrace more flexibility in how we work, we believe it's more important than ever to invest in our campuses and that doing so will make for better products, a greater quality of life for our employees, and stronger communities. Earlier this month, the company asked workers to begin returning to the office. Last year, the company was approved for its downtown West project in Silicon Valley's San Jose. The project is expected to create 25,000 new jobs, 7 million square feet of office space, and 4,000 new homes. Some locals were concerned that the project would increase housing prices and minimally benefit the community. Nationwide, Google reportedly plans to invest about $9.5 billion in property across the United States which is up from $7 billion last year. A wildland firefighter recently resigned from the U.S. Forest Service. In his resignation letter, he wrote that the agency is failing to firefighters on so many levels. NTD's David Lamb reports. Chris Mariano was a squad boss with the Truckee Hotshots and resigned his position on April 7th. In a two-page resignation letter obtained by Wildfire Today, a wildfire news site, Mariano listed what he says are deficiencies in the U.S. Forest Service. He alleges that the agency seems to be driven by political success instead of caring for the land and people. Despite establishing procedures for unmanned aerial systems or drones and operating them for two years, he says the agency considered him unqualified to work full-time in that position. He wrote that the agency is failing its firefighters on so many levels, classification, pay, work-life balance, mental health, presumptive disease coverage, and injury fatality support. In a letter from Scott Berghardt, superintendent of the Truckee Hotshots, 
Burgard says Mariano was instrumental in bringing UAS to the fire line and introducing technologies to a technologically stagnant environment. He lamented Mariano's resignation, saying every aspect of our wildfire suppression workforce is struggling to retain, recruit, and simply staff. Entity reached out to the superintendent and the Forest Service for further details. Mariano says he plans to move into the private sector to continue training others how to operate drones, as well as help develop its use in wildfires. David Lamb, Entity News, California. Environmentalists and state biologists are disagreeing about the status of California's Joshua trees. Should the tree be labeled as endangered or not? Let's see what the two sites are saying. State biologists said that the Joshua tree, an iconic desert tree native to Southern California, should not be labeled as threatened with extinction. Their comments come in contradiction to environmental groups that say climate change is threatening the desert species. The Los Angeles Times reported that the final decision on the tree's status is up to the Fish and Game Commission. If they do not list it as endangered, then it will be up to local jurisdictions to define any developmental limitations in the areas the trees inhabit. The renewable energy industry is grabbing up swaths of sun-baked California land for solar development. Despite using the Joshua Tree's land, the developers say mitigating climate change will save the tree. A 158 report released Wednesday said the Joshua Tree is currently abundant and widespread. The report concluded that current state data does not demonstrate that the population is decreasing or in serious danger for the foreseeable future. Environmentalists oppose the suggestion, citing global warming. A final decision on the tree's status is expected in June. Easter is just around the corner, which usually means a demand for bunnies. One organization has been trying to educate the public about the correct way to adopt a bunny and avoid buying them illegally. These healthy rabbits are well cared for and are waiting to be adopted. They are under the care of a nonprofit organization called the Bunny World Foundation that has been promoting animal care since 2008. I would like people to really take time to understand that these are not just Easter gifts. These are sentient beings who feel, who cry, who love, who live up to 15 years. So it's not something that you buy for Easter and then you discard it the next day. Hadro Maratrovich discourages people from buying bunnies at the pet store that aren't fixed. She says people should adopt one from a rescue who are already vaccinated, spayed, neutered and defleed. Please don't buy babies because they are a complete nightmare if they survive. A lot of these babies are too young um, when they're taken away from their mothers, their immune systems are completely trashed and um, they won't make it. And if they do, you'll probably get rid of them because they're not fixed. And it's very expensive to fix the bunny. So you're better off taking the bunny from the, from the rescue. And here's Lolita Rose will say the same thing. She says rabbits are creatures of habit and are high maintenance, but not difficult. People can still go to work during the day. All you have to do is make sure that they have what they need and you do a little we call it a treat test. You take a piece of banana, apple, carrot, and you test. And if the bunny takes it, something that they really love, you're good. You can go to work. When you come back home, treat test again. Give, give the bunny your fa you know, his or her favorite uh, treat. And then if they take it, you're good. Rabbits also need to be brushed every six to eight weeks. Hadra Moratovich says giving bunnies the same love and affection as a family member gives them emotional support. There is a legend that says that the bunnies that you have in this life are the children from your past lives, which is very spooky. <laughs> you know, I was like, how many children did I have? <laughs> the foundation has rescued over 15,000 bunnies since its inception. They work with six city shelters and rescue about 80 bunnies per month. Now to NTD's Thomas Christian for an update on sports. I'm Thomas Christian, giving you the California Today Sports Roundup. Players across Major League Baseball will don Jackie Robinson's number 42 and all of them in Dodger blue this year for the 75th anniversary of Robinson's big league debut. 
The Dodgers, of course, will be at home in Los Angeles, facing the Cincinnati Reds. They'll be joined by Robinson's 99-year-old widow, Rachel, and her son, David. Earlier in the day, David Robinson will read the book I Am Jackie Robinson at Longfellow Elementary School in Pasadena, California, where Robinson grew up. He'll be joined by Robinson's grandmother, Io, pitcher David Price, and Players Alliance founders Curtis Granderson and Edwin Jackson. Outfielder Mookie Betts will join the Robinson family at nearby John Muir High School for the unveiling of a mural of Robinson. He starred in football, basketball, baseball, and track at the Pasadena School in the 1930s. Meanwhile, in New York, Commissioner Rob Manfred will host an event for youth baseball players from the city in Times Square with special guests Ken Griffey Jr., Mariano Rivera, CC Sabathia, Joe Torre, Willie Randolph, and Butch Husky. It's all Dodgers headlines today as we bring you a little bit out of the world of sports business. Four confirmed bidders remain in the battle to take over the Prem League club, Chelsea, after Russian owner Roman Abramovich was hit by the UK government's sanctions following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. But one of those four bidders is Dodgers co-owner Todd Bowley. Chelsea was initially put up for sale by Abramovich before sanctions were imposed on the oligarch by the British government effectively giving it control of the club. The LA Dodgers co-owner Todd Bowley is making a move for an ownership stake, and his group includes Swiss billionaire Hans-Jörg Weiss. The Ricketts family, who own the Chicago Cubs, is also bidding, although they are unpopular with Chelsea fans. But they strengthened their bid team with the appointment of Lord Karen Billamoria, the founder of Cobra Beer, who says he has been a Chelsea season ticket holder for many years. A group led by British Airways chairman Martin Broughton, who is also a former chairman of Liverpool Football Club, includes World Athletics president Sebastian Coe and wealthy investors from around the world. American investor Stefan Pagliuca hinted on Tuesday at being prepared to divest his interest in Italian club Atalanta to buy Chelsea as he prepares to submit his bid. Pagliuca, who is also the joint owner of the NBA team the Boston Celtics, agreed to buy into the Serie A club Atalanta in February, buying 55% of Ladia, the holding that is owned by Italy's Percassi family, which owns around 86% of the club. Under European soccer governing body UEFA's rules, two clubs participating in the same competition cannot be directly or indirectly controlled by the same entity or managed by the same person. All of those factors point to Bully being the leading bidder since he has the least restrictions in terms of ownership, rules, and other regulations. If Bully were to win the bidding war and land an ownership stake in Chelsea, that would likely mean the English football club and its many stars will be visiting Southern California a lot more often for exhibition matches. As always, I'm Thomas Christian, and thanks for tuning in. And that's all for tonight. You can join us again on California Today every weekday at 8.30 p.m. If you have any news tips or ideas for our show, or you just want to let us know how we're doing, our email is california.today at ntd.com. I'm Liang Zhang. Have a nice weekend.